Can I get someone to read out Revelation 14 verses 1 to 5? And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. These were they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which followed the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile for they are without fault before the throne of God. Hmm. Now, before we actually look at, you know, how are these people described here um, in, in detail, I want to sort of just get like a, a overview of where they fit. You know, like the, the question is why is are they presented here in this scene in Revelation? So the question we're looking at is, is who are they and why are they presented here? You know, what's been spoken of before and what follows after? And why is it at this point in sort of the, the flow of revelation, are we given a picture of God's people here? Gaylene. I'm wondering, given you know, Revelation 13, it's like, is there any hope? It's like, it, it seems so bad. You know, is it a case of, you know, are God's people to be wiped out? You know, when, when Christ asks, um, Oh, is there any faith left on the earth? Or when he comes back, will he find faith on the earth? It's kind of like that. And then you've got this wee, it's like a wee interlude that says, this is the success that you know, God is vindicated by these people. You know, that there is um, hope. That there is um, people that have been redeemed. You know, that the God and Christ were successful, if you will. But I guess it's more to show hope after something so grim. Mm -hmm. Ian? Yeah, along the same lines, I think you've just had the mark of the beast. And uh, so um, God wants us to understand the uh, the complete opposite of that the the antithesis the only other theme you can be on hmm. yeah and, and and building on that idea you know we've seen the, the the mark of the beast it goes out this death decree they can't buy or sell this this power is is enforced this upon the whole world um and then now we're, we're pictured as as god's people um you know it, it, like you're saying shows the other side but to carry on that further the question is is how are god's people depicted w where are they In heaven? Mm. Yeah, they're, they're with, with the Lamb on Mount Sion, the place where God rules from. Yeah, this, this, this heavenly scene. Uh, Gaylene? 
Oh, I was just going to say they are before the throne of God, but I don't think they actually are. Or is this after the city has come down? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if, if I could sum it up in, in one word, I would just say God's people are seen as, as being victorious. You know, they overcome. They did not, you know, wander after the beast. You know, in chapter 13, we see that all the world wandered after the beast. But here in verse 14, these are those which followed the lamb wherever he led. And so in the face of all this persecution, God's people were faithful. They overcome. And so that's what, what leads up to this. In the midst of all this, this persecution, and it seems like, you know, that whole chapter, we were focusing on the, the powers of Satan and what he's doing. And now God wants to bring our focus back to his people will be victorious in the face of all this persecution and oppression. But then what follows on after this, after we've seen this picture of God's people, what's the next thing Revelation goes on to speak about and how is that connected as well? Matthew, could you tell me what verse you're looking at, please? Uh, the, the God's people, the 144,000 that are seen there in Revelation 14, verses 1 oh. to 5. Uh -huh. they're, they're pictured then. And then the question is, what follows on from that? What's the next thing that is presented in Revelation? And uh, how do yeah. those connect? Uh, Ian, I guess the, the the messages from these three angels uh, uh, presenting the everlasting gospel, um, and that's that, that then unpacks um, the uh, the the end result of those who get the mark and those who have the seal. Yep. So we've, we've pictured God's people standing there being victorious, victorious during this, this end time persecution and then the message that they have been given. So that's sort of where, where this is 144,000 here are presented in the flow of Revelation. Now we're going to look at those verses and look at the, the details that are presented. First of all, in Revelation 14 verse 1, we read and it tells us that they looked and lo, the Lamb stood on Mount Sion and with him 144,000, having his Father's name in their foreheads. Now, they're pictured there as a standing in Mount Zion with the Lamb. Um, and so the question we have is, is why Mount Zion? What is significant about Mount Zion? And what information does that add us? And we're going to look at um, a couple of verses. First is in Psalms 2. Can someone read Psalms 2 and verse 6? Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. So there God speaks about Zion as being the place where he is, you know, established his his king, his anointed one to rule from. 
Now, what farm was that, please? Uh, that was Psalms, chap uh, Psalms 2, chapter 2, verse 6. Psalms 2, verse 6. Yeah. Okay, so so Mount Zion is the place where God has enthroned his king, this, this messianic king, to rule from. But asking the question further in, in the context of, of this psalm, what is the, the theme running through this psalm? What does it start out speaking about? And how does the psalm end? What is, what's the flow of this? And where does this... Um, appointing this king to rule in Mount Zion, how does that fit into the flow of Psalms chapter 2? Gaylene. The um the heathen, the those that are against the Lord, against his anointed, they there is rebellion. Yeah, there is a deliberate going away from God and his anointed, obviously, which is Christ. And then it's got, I think the important word in verse six is yet. You know, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion there's a um uh oh, what would you say despite all this going on you know all the heathen and the rebellious and the wicked and the whatever despite all this going on my king I have set my king on this on my holy hill despite all that's going on my king still rules and this is where he rules. Obviously, could be literal, could be figurative, or a bit of both. Mm -hmm. But um, and then goes on um, about how he, how the wicked are dealt with, essentially, what happens to them because mm -hmm. his king is set upon um, his holy hill. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, and I, I find what you've sort of just, just laid out there, that flow of that psalm, quite interesting when we compare that to where it's used in Revelation. You know, the psalm starts out, we've got the wicked rebelling against God, wanting to, you know, cast a, cast them off, cast their bands aside, wanting to, to rebel against God. And God makes this announcement that the king reigns in Zion. And he goes on to... So in verse 7, that I'll declare the decree, the Lord has sent to me, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So we know that this is this messianic psalm talking about Christ, that the, the son of God ruling. And so we, we have Christ being established as king in Mount Zion. And then it carries on talking about him ruling with a rod of iron, breaking them in pieces like potter's vessel, which that is quoted you know, elsewhere in Revelation, under the, the seventh trump in Revelation 11, um, speaking of, you know, the, the, the second coming, when, you know, the, the wicked are destroyed by the brightness of its coming. And so we have this pattern of the, the kingdoms of this world rising up in rebellion against God, Christ being enthroned as king on Mount Zion, and then him coming back to judge the world and rule it. And in Revelation 13, you've got, you know, all the world rises up in rebellion against God, enforcing this mark of the beast and this, this image of the beast. Then we see a picture of Christ on Mount Zion, you know, as which is here is, is where he's made king to rule in Mount Zion. And then following on, on from that, that, that Revelation 14 closes, with a picture of the second coming, with Christ coming down on the clouds with a, sick, a sickle in his hand to harvest the earth. And so seeing Christ there as, as the lamb, standing in Mount Zion, it brings to, to mind this idea that he is the king, that he will reign victorious. 
and that God's people are, are there standing with the victorious king that will rule the world. Why all these these nations and, and powers down here try to, to fight and struggle and persecute God's people to try to take the, this world for themselves? God has set his king who will reign. The son of God is standing there in Mount Zion with the 144,000 and they will be victorious. Um, just one more verse if we jump to Micah. Micah chapter 4. Uh, Micah chapter 4 and verse 7. Can someone read that? Micah 4 verse 7. And I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. So again, what is so again what is this verse in uh, Micah uh, speaking about? That the remnant will also reign in Mount Zion. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. God's gathering his people and he says he will reign in, in Mount Zion forever. And that's when he, he calls that remnant to him. And so jumping back into revelation when we see the land standing here on mount zion with the 144,000, this is his people that he is called to reign with him that he's standing in, in you know the, the place there as as king who will reign who will rule the world by all the people on earth that are scheming and plotting and satan has his powers that are trying to rise up to destroy god's people christ is, is, is there standing in Mount Zion as the king who will reign, who will be victorious, and his kingdom will be forever. Amen. Now, we have a question. So, so Christ is there, but it's also with him, the 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And now the, the question is, is this sort of a, a picture we're given um, of God's people sort of in, in the future after the controversy is all finished and they're reigning with him? Or is this more speaking about at the time when, you know, Revelation 13, that mark of the beast is being enforced, and then after them we've got the three angels' message that's being preached, um, and God's people are pictured here so is it at the time when the gospel is being preached and when you know that second beast is um carrying out its its satanic purposes so the context would seem to fit better that god's this is a picture of god's people during the um you know final stage of this earth's history that final message but then how can that be when God's people are seen standing with Christ in, in, in heavenly places? And if we can turn to Ephesians, there is um, a verse in there. I just want someone to read Ephesians 
chapter 2, verse 6. And the question is, how are God's people described in Ephesians 2, verse 6? Can I get uh, someone to read that out? Ephesians 2, verse 6. I read it. Um, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So there as well, God's people are, are spoken of as being in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So even though physically we're here on this earth it's talking about spiritually we are in in heavenly places okay we, we are with christ and that's sort of how i understand what's going on here in revelation 14 god's people the 144,000, are on earth carrying out their message but spiritually, they are with Christ in heavenly places. They are, they are with their king who is leading them wherever um, he rules them to go. Uh, Gaylene. Um, with, for that sort of thing, the first verse that always comes to mind is Romans 14, 17 where it says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Well, that's here, that's now, that's with us, you know, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Hmm. That's, so the kingdom of God we can have now is available to us now. So why would we have to wait for the literal, the literal reality, when you know we can have um, the citizenship of that future kingdom, and all its benefits is available to us now. We just haven't physically immigrated yet. <laughs> mm. Margarita. I don't think it can be literal because they're either living or they're dead, except for the uh, first fruits and Moses and, you know, them. So, um, but I think it's an encouragement to say after it's all over, that's the end result in heaven with Christ mm. in victory. Just like after the three angels' messages are finished in chapter 12, it's the second coming. Well, that hasn't happened yet either. So I think they're both future. Mm -hmm. Now, they're spoken of there in, in the King James. Um, it says that they have his father's name written in their foreheads. Um, do we have any other versions that have something different or something added in there? Has anyone got an ESV or another version that has anything? The NLT I've got here, I'll read it to you. I've just got to change screens. 
Mm-hmm. And I saw the lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Mm. That that's very along the same lines as um the ESV. Um, and you know that, that raised the question to me when when I noticed that um a little while ago. Um, one says that the that seal of the living God, that the hundred forty thousand sealed in your foreheads, is just that the Father's name. Others said it's it's His name, so the Lamb, Jesus, Jesus' name, and the Son's name written in their foreheads. And so that is a question: is is it just the Father's name, or is it the Father and Son that is, is sealed in their foreheads? Um. And so I, I did a little digging into the. The manuscripts and it turns out in um you know the actual the the majority text the the byzantine manuscripts this is not not looking at, at vaticanus or sinaiticus but just a, in the majority text it actually does say um his name and his father's it is referring to the names of the father and the son it appears the um earlier editions of the texas receptors of some of the the earlier ones um, didn't have that, but um, as Erasmus kept going and, and, and others continued on from that, these manuscripts, um, yeah, the, the majority of the evidence is that it does point to that the seal of, of the living God there is the name of the father and son in their foreheads. Uh, Gayling. So that would match up then with John 17, 3. Hmm. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Mm -hmm. Yep. Ian? And Jody was just saying to me, my wife in the background here, that um, if name represents character in the Bible, then it makes sense that we have the character shared by um the divine father and his son in us and to me you know jesus is the name above all names um and it's the only name by which we're saved so it makes sense to me to have his name Hmm. and one day we'll have his new name on us um it says later in revelation that we, we have his new name written on us i think we have three things we have our new name his new name and and the name of the new jerusalem i think something like that from memory Hmm. And it also matches with a lot of the other stuff we see in Revelation. Like in, in Revelation 4 or 5, that, that heavenly worship scene, they are worshipping the, the Father, him that sits on the throne, and the Son. In, in chapter 5, the, the Lamb that stood in the midst as though it had been slain. So it's the Father and Son that are worshipped. When, you know, you, you look at the, those seated on the throne, you know, it's the father and son are seated on the throne. You know, in, in that final, you know, closing scenes of Revelation where it describes the new heaven and new earth. You know, that river of life flows from the throne of, you know, the, the father and the son. Um, and so throughout Revelation, this book that has this, this huge focus on worship, you know, the whole mark of the beast that we looked at last week was all about, worship was all about this beast power this this satanic agency trying to turn people away from worshiping the true god into this false worship and in response to that god's people have the name of of, you know the the gods that that they were the who they worship written on their foreheads the father and son which is what we see in revelation four or five is what we see at the end of revelation throughout the the father and son are, are the focus of the true worship throughout the book of revelation and Babylon is trying to pull people away from the true worship to this false system of worship. And we see that, you know, as we're going to look in, in later on, and we might touch on a little bit here um, in a minute, um, in Revelation 17, where you see this, the, the, this Babylon, there's this whore that rides this beast, the whole idea that this is this, this false worship, and on her forehead, she has something else written. 
you know, the mystery Babylon the Great, you know, mother of the, the, the harlots. All these things are, are written on her forehead as opposed to God's people simply having the one they worship written on their foreheads. It pops up in verse 4 as well in Revelation 14 because they're the first fruits to God and to the Lamb as well. Hmm. And so, yeah, all of Revelation is about true and false worship. The true worship is to the Father and Son. And Satan's trying to pull people away to that, to a false type of worship. Now, um, so once they're described there, can someone read out uh, Revelation 14, verses 2 and 3? And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts, the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. Hmm. So here they're, they're singing this song. Um, and they sung not just any song, a new song that no one else could learn but the 144,000. And the, the question you put out there is why? What, what ideas do people have about why is this new song one that no one else can learn? it's an experience that only they have experienced hmm. yeah if, if you look through a lot of the the, the songs in, in the bible like the the psalms you know it's, it's the the song book of god's people a lot of those psalms it's the people singing about their experience you know whether it's david and, and psalm 51 it's the psalms of repentance you know, against thee, the only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou judgest. You know, and he, he's pouring out this repentance, a, a, you know, a, a broken heart. That is the sacrifice that is acceptable to God. Or, he, you know, to see, you know, as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and staff, they comfort me. You know, he, he's singing about these experiences he has, he has had with God. You know, every time he, he's going through something, when Saul's chasing him, trying to kill him, he pours out his, his you know, heart to God in, in these songs, these prayers, this, this conversation. He's singing about that experience. You know, and, and as we go through there, we, we can connect to a lot of those experiences, not in the same things. You know, I've never been hunted through a, a wilderness by someone trying to, to run me through with a spear but you know we have all i'm sure we've all experienced those times where we've stepped out in, in faith to god and had people you know attack us persecute us because of that you know we're we are in those situations where those who should be leaders of God's church, who should be bringing people to righteousness, are actually turning God's people to attack those that are doing his work. And so we can share in a lot of those experiences, but the 144,000 here, their experience is going to be something that no one else has had. Uh, Ian. Just by way of example, I remember in, in 1997, I was living in London. And uh, while I was there, uh, Princess Diana was, was killed in that tunnel. And um, 
yeah, for for uh, for anyone who was outside, I know that uh, my mum and dad were telling me all the latest Diana jokes, you know, all over the phone when I was talking to them. And I felt that people were so insensitive because I was right there in London and I went down, I actually um, went down in front of uh, where her and Charles used to live um, in Kensington, I think it is. And there was this sea, like literally maybe five or six acres of just flowers, candles burning, um, teddy bears, messages, uh, people just standing around crying and it was just this mournful scene. And, uh, and then uh, not long after that, I actually um, flew to Paris and um, I was just wandering, happened to be wandering around and I ended up wandering across the tunnel where she died. And on top of it, there was this memorial that had been already erected, uh, you know, less than, less than two months after, after her death. And all these flowers were around it. And I remember when I came back to Australia and asking people about it because the Sabbath uh, of her funeral uh, in, in London, I, um, my, I lived about uh, 15 miles north of London and I would catch the tube to church and I would go into central London Adventist church. And, and I remember this particular morning, I walked about a, one and a half kilometers to the tube station didn't see a single car on the road, didn't see a single human being, got on, uh, waited for the tube to come along. It came along. I got on the tube. There was absolutely nobody on the train and uh, traveled all the way into London. Um, had to make it two changes. Uh, I think I eventually saw a lady on a platform in a distance. And then I got out um, in central London and walked the sort of half a kilometer to the front of the church and it wasn't until I got to the steps of the church that there was the, the usual welcoming lady who used to shake everybody's hand there. And she and I because I was I thought, man, I felt like I was in an abandoned city. There was nobody around. There was no cars moving on the road at all uh, in this city of 10 million people plus. And um, so it really had an impact on me. And, and, and that day was it was a really eerie day, the day of her funeral, which we didn't watch it because it was on the Sabbath. But um yeah, to, to, to then come back and relate that experience to people and, and for them to just act like it wasn't such a big deal. And I felt like there's no way for them to understand. They had to live through what I lived through. They had to see what I saw. They had to, to, to be in London to know the impact of, of this, this moment. I just think that's a, that's a sort of similar sort of thing. I know it's very different, but yeah, you, the, the, these people who have, been through these trials and it's daunting to think about because we're not not even close yet i don't think well we're close but we're not we're not going through it um quite yet um i think um only they can know that song hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and just a very good illustration you know um sort of had, had a similar thing living here in Christchurch when we had the the earth big earthquake that came through you know just the you know when, when you're, you're standing in the house and everything starts shaking and you know you, you I remember at school doing the earthquake drills and they talk about, you know, if you can get outside or just, un, you know, get under a table or go, get to a doorway or something like that. But the, the fact is when it started happening, you, you actually couldn't. You, you, you couldn't walk anywhere. The ground was shaking so much that you just fall over. You know, you just, yeah, all these things about, you know, getting outside under something. No, you, you're just staying exactly where you are. You can't do anything. At most, you can fall on the ground and, and try to roll a little bit, um, you know. But you know, the actual you, you can describe that, you can say it, but the actual experience is, yeah, it's something that you can hear about it, but until you see it yourself, you don't really understand. It. Until you've been in something like that yourself, you don't. Um, but you know, I, I've been in that earthquake but other people could have been in other natural disasters and you can sort of understand a similar thing, you know, different events, but 
what the 144,000 here go through is something um, so different than has ever been experienced by anyone else that, that no one else can actually understand that experience. You know, they're, they're living through that final time, that final, the, the, the persecution, you know, if, if it's just the, the death decree, you know, of the mark of the beast, that no buying, no selling, you know, people have lived through stuff like that before, you know, when, you know, whether it's the inquisitions, you know, or, or the Holocaust where it was illegal to be a Jew that was punishable by death. You know, people have been through stuff like that before. So it's not simply referring to the, the, the persecution that they are going to suffer. But there is a, another experience of God's people that lived through that last time with, with the, the close of probation, as it's referred to, where Christ's mediation in the heavenly sanctuary is finished. And there's this time where there is no mediator that they, they live through that time um you know without sin as it goes on to describe their character and they are they are faultless that's something that no one else has has ever had to do that describes the the experience the the closeness of their walk with god that has brought them to that point is something no one else has ever had Now, it carries on to describe them in verse 4. Can someone read that out for us? These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb with the soever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Hmm. So the first thing we're told about them is that they are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Um, and so the the question is, is what does this mean? We know Revelations, it's a full of symbology. Well, what is the significance of this idea that they're virgins, that they're not defiled with women? Uh, Gaylene? Would it be that they're not, because they're virgins, virgins are pure and innocent and, you know, all that sort of things, more purity. Would it be the fact that women are a symbol of, a church you know god's people so could it be that because they are pure they are virgins then they are not defiled with apostasy from other churches that haven't been influenced um by other teachings and apostasy and yeah you know, they've kept their faith in what they believe pure mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, Petra. That word defiled, um, looking at the original language, means besmeared with mud or filth. So that fits with what you're saying there, Kayleen. Mm hmm Can someone read for me Revelation 17, uh, verses 1 and 2? And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the of the of that great day great for that sitteth upon many waters until it's well yes. with whom the kings of the earth 
have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made to drunk with the wine of her fornication. Hmm. So the, the question is, who is it speaking about here and how are they described? They're described as drunk, which means that their thinking is no longer clear mm -hmm. or their comprehension. What's made them drunk? Interacting with the whore, Babylon. Yeah. The drunk with the, the wine of fornication. And so you got here that this end time Babylon being described as this, this great whore that goes about committing fornication with the kings of the earth, contrasted with God's people that are spoken about as being undefiled with women that, that, that are virgins. And so you got the idea of here fornication. Um, being used to describe this this corruption that is going on this defilement and a lot of this imagery is, is drawn from the old testament um if we can turn to the book of jeremiah can somebody read uh jeremiah Chapter three, verses one to three. Sorry, could you give that reference again, please? Jeremiah, Sorry, Anne. Jeremiah chapter three, verses one to three. Uh, Thank yeah. you. I better find it because I wanted to say something quickly first. But yeah, sometimes it, I think that's a really apt description. You talk to people and you, if you start to tell them truth, they they get wild very quickly and, and behave like drunks. Um, because, and it, and it can be the, the, the smallest thing that can, can set them off. You know, um, there's somebody in this town that's not very happy with me at the moment and he keeps telling my son, all the, all the terrible things that I've done to him. And, I, and when he relays the things that, he, that I've done to him, it doesn't match reality. And I think, what, what's, what, what's going on? What, I, didn't, I didn't say it. I didn't say anything like that. And I didn't say that. And, and uh, you know, um, you start to think, what's wrong? Why, 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 why can't I, why can't you even talk sense to people? And, and yet, um, it seems sometimes like they're, they're inebriated, you know, their brains aren't functioning. Um, I'm sure I've been the same in my life, but um, yeah, so it's verses uh, one to three. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. uh, this is New King James. Uh, they say, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's, may he return to her again? Would not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return to me, says the Lord. Lift up your eyes to the desolate heights and see where you have not, where, where have you not lain with, with men? By the road you have sat for them, like the Ar Arabian in the wilderness. Sorry, my glasses aren't working at this distance. <laughs> and you have polluted the land with your harlotries and your wickedness. Therefore, the showers have been withheld and there has been no latter rain. You have had a harlot's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. Hmm. So there, it starts off just referring to, you know, a man and his wife and, and how that's spoken of adultery in the law. But then God applies that to between him and Israel, that they have played the harlot against him, that his people have, have gone and 
you know, committed fornication against him. So obviously that this, this can't be referring to any literal fornication because it's a church committing it against God. So what is the unfaithfulness spoken of here? Uh, Petra. Going on from what you said, Ian, and also from these verses, it's interesting that there are variations of ways that people go when they're drunk. You have happy drunks, you have angry drunks, you have sleepy drunks. You know, you've got a whole range of impacts on people when they're drunk. Um, so there are different ways that people lose comprehension or act instead of facing up to truth. And similar in some ways with adultery in that usually the people who follow those paths appear to find ways to change the truth to justify their course of action. So it's still a, a stepping away from truth in a way that makes them feel okay with what they're doing to some degree. Um, I appreciate that this says in verse three, thou hadest a whore's forehead. So the forehead, the front lobe, the prefrontal cortex, it's where our moral decisions are made. You know, sometimes people have a car accident and that part of the brain is severely damaged and they have a complete personality change. They may have had good morals in their character and suddenly it's completely different. So a horse forehead, we know the, the father's name and the son's name written in the forehead, but instead here, we have somebody that's self-focused and has a fluid approach to what they consider truth. Hmm. You also get immoral drunks too, people that get very sexually promiscuous when they're drunk. And that kind of fits with this, this group of people probably as well. Hmm. I mean, after talking to them about playing the harlot, um, you know, including the land with, with whoredom, at the beginning of verse two, it says, lift up thy eyes unto the high places and see where thou hast not been lain with. Um, now, what is significant about the high places? If you're familiar with the Old Testament, what happened in the high places? Uh, Gaylene? That's where the um, idols often were, mm. in the caves and um, yeah, in the groves and what have you. But yeah, it's where um, the idols were placed. And then obviously the um, subsequent worship of those idols. Hmm. Yeah, the, the high places were where they set up idols, where they, they practice their idolatry. Um, and a, a lot of the practice of idol worship was actual um, fornication and immorality. But it's also using that as the, the symbol to talk about Israel's broken covenant with God. That, you know, as, as the church is the bride of Christ, that, you know, they were his. And then they went out and cheated on him with all the other gods of the nations around about them. And so it speaks about Israel's unfaithfulness to God as being harlotry, as being adultery, as being fornication. Just like you know, in Revelation 17, we have this picture of this, this unfaithful woman, you know, that this woman being a symbol of the church, but it's going out and committing fornication with all the kings of the earth. It's a church that's not faithful to God, that instead of having this relationship and connection with God, she's going out and having relationships with all the kings of the earth. She, she, she's, you know, as God's true church, is a church that tries to get close to God, be faithful to God, follow him. But this Babylonian church is a church that is trying to build up relationships with the world, to control the world, that is not worried about Christ, that is, you know, being, committing fornication against them. Uh, Gaylene. I find it interesting too that the latter rain is to be withheld 
but also mm -hmm. that um, the 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 whore, uh, the uh, when they you know dealing with idolatry and stuff. That last one, they'll refuse us to be ashamed. So it, it's it just a straight out refusal. But interesting mm -hmm. that it's one that they're refusing to be ashamed. You, it, it's not like um, the word that comes to mind is brazen. Would, would another word that fit would that be pride? Oh yeah. We've seen that before, haven't we? we, we we've had a month of that recently. I, I was thinking more 6,000 plus years ago, <laughs> actually. But yeah. 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 Oh, yes, there refuses to be. A sh oh, yes. You know, it's like good grief, put some clothes on just for a start, you know, mm. um, in, in, in some cases. Um, but yeah, it's just interesting that it's an re absolute refusal. I, I just, yeah, sorry, that, that just struck me. Mm -hmm. uh, picture. It also strikes me looking at these verses one to three here that they say, yet return again to me. You do all these things, yet you return again to me. And then verse three, but you have a horse forehead. So there is this false religion constantly in here. This is not somebody going away from God, this is somebody basically trying to have your cake and eat it. Mm -hmm. They want to, they want, but they also want to be on God's team. And mm -hmm. they're disrespecting God by attempting to do that and misleading people too. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that is a really interesting point, especially when we, you know, what we read about in Revelation before in chapter 17, because when it carries on to describe, um, you know, that hall, it says in a forehead is something written, you know, Babylon, oh, so mystery, you know, Babylon, you know, mother of, of harlots, you know, that's, she's got harlotry in, in, in her forehead. Um, but it's interesting here, as you mentioned, God's people are spoken of here as, as having this false forehead of refusing to be ashamed, yet they come back to God, but they're not coming back repentant, they're coming back with all their, their adulteries and, and their whoredoms they're still um, claiming to be God's people, even though they're committing adultery with the world. And then the same thing in Revelation, that gives us this idea that, that Babylon isn't going to be this system that openly denounces God. They're going to be a system that claims to be worshipping God, yet has a horse forehead. They're going to be trying to convince the world. That's the idea that we looked at last week as well, with that beast from the earth deceives the world. Okay, they're claiming that they are God's people. They're claiming that they are the true church, yet they have a horse forehead. Now, can someone read for me in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 and 3? And I want us to notice how Paul speaks about the Corinthian church um, in this passage. Where was it, sorry? Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Mm. Was it just the two? Yep. Cool. Yep. So, uh, so something that's interesting about this, he speaks about presenting those in the Corinthian church to Christ as, as a chaste virgin. 
Um, but if you're familiar with the Corinthian church, what's taught some of the stuff that's been happening in that church leading up to this point? What, what, what are some of the other things that Paul's talked about in his, in his previous letter? Wasn't it someone, they were letting somebody be with somebody that they shouldn't be with or something to that effect? Mm -hmm. um, a man with his... Father's wife, yeah. His or something, yeah, or yeah, something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And they were um, complicit in... He, he reproved them, rebuked them for being complicit in not speaking up, mm -hmm. if I remember rightly. Yep. That's one issue. That there, what, what other ones do we have? That there's a whole list we could choose from, just... Also, the possibility of people misrepresenting Paul um, in, a, in 11 verses 2 and 3 there, well, verse 3, he beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted. So that subtlety, as we saw in the previous few verses, this is going to be people claiming they represent God. And there are subtleties that are going to mislead people unless they have a close personal connection to God. Mm -hmm. And they will present those who are truly following God. Hmm. Yeah, I, Paul talked earlier, I think early on in, in First Corinthians about different divisions arising within the church. He speaks to them about um, divorce, about, you know, brothers taking brothers to to law where to, to having lawsuits against each other's dragging them to the courts where it should be sorted out you know with, within the church according to the principles of christ you know there's fornication going on there's there's idolatry going on you know people going to pagan feasts was, was still happening there there was all this self-exaltation and selfishness over the manifestation of spiritual gifts there's people there um, denying the resurrection. He deals about that in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, you know, the, the church in the Corinthians has got so much stuff going wrong in it. A lot of that stuff that was dealt with in the first letter, it would, you know, if, if there was a church today that was doing half the stuff that the Corinthians were, were doing, it's a church that's, um, I think everyone would be very comfortable writing off. Um, but Paul is writing them here. And he says that, you know, I have espoused you unto one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And that's something that's, that stands out to me. Um, you know, it, we know what the church has been like, but now he's speaking about presenting them as a chaste virgin to Christ as though that, that they are pure and undefiled to Christ. So this idea that with the 144,000, you know, they are not defiled women for they are, they are virgins. You know, we've seen throughout the Old Testament that, that that speaks about purity and faithfulness to Christ, whereas fornication and adultery is, is people wandering from God and unfaithfulness. But here, um, Paul talks about presenting the Corinthians as chaste virgins to Christ, as being, you know, a, a faithful bride. So it doesn't mean that they've never fallen, they've never made mistakes. But that speaks to me of the, the extent to which the gospel can sanctify and purify his people. And the, the danger that he speaks about, as you mentioned there, Petra, is less as the serpent beguiled Eve. They should be corrupted 
away from the simplicity of Christ. And then he goes on to preach for if, in verse four, for if he that cometh preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. So it's talking about the dangers of being dragged away to, to a, a false Christ, a false spirit, a false gospel. Is, is what's in, in danger of that. Uh, Petra. As you've touched on just before, Matthew, what I really appreciate about all of this is the promise that God can present us pure to his father. Mm. Uh, that Jesus can present us pure to his father. And it doesn't matter where we've been and what we've done. He can give us a pure forehead with the father's name mm -hmm. and the son's name in our forehead. This is possible. It doesn't matter where we've come from. For those that have been elsewhere in spiritual adultery, the problem with them was that they still had mystery written in their forehead. Whereas God gives us, it has me think of that verse that he's promised us a clear mind. Um, and that's spiritually as well as functional. So, yeah, I really like the promise aspect of it. Now, jumping back into Revelation 14, after describing them as virgins, saying that they are, are pure and, and faithful to God, not that they've never made mistakes or they've never wandered from God, but the gospel have had such an amazing work on them that they have been completely purified. And so that now they are standing there with the lamb, completely faithful. And then says, these are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. And um, the previously, to this we've seen the lamb mentioned can in connection with the seals in revelation 5 and previous in chapter 13 um you know guiding his people through this time of persecution and in both times the lambs presented with a, a similar description can somebody read for me revelation 13 verse 8 and how is the lamb described there I read it. It says, um, and all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Hmm. How is the lamb described there? Yeah, I always wondered about this one. Slain from the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Christ is the, the, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now we know that the, you know, as, as the lamb of God, it was a Calvary um, that he became the sacrifice, well, well, that he fulfilled the sacrifice. But it was from the very beginning that, you know, that promise was given that he would be that lamb. Uh, Petra. Unlike people, God's promises are as good as done. And the plan for the salvation of humanity was in place before it was needed. Mm -hmm. Ian. I guess it also takes me back in my mind to Genesis and... Uh, you know, Christ walking through the garden saying, Adam, where are you? Eve, where are you? And then they cover themselves with fig leaves and he has to uh, personally be the one who, who clothes them with animal skins. And um, so this, the slaying of the lamb is, is, is symbolic, but it's also 
been a necessary thing since sin came in, which was right back at the beginning, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yes, Petra. In a slightly different direction, when you mentioned before that 44,000 following the land wherever he goes, and that's later on. But it just struck me it also applies very much to now. Mm. You know, he'll direct your path. If he's leading and we're following, then we will follow him wherever he points now. And that's the relationship that leads to him being able to steal us. So, yes, that first mm. applies, but it really is a mirror to what he's calling us to now. So that he can fire. Well, yeah, one thing that stands out to me about this as well is, is there in chapter 13, the lamb was slain. Um, earlier on, we see him in chapter five with the opening of the seals. John says, he, Behold, he saw a lamb stood as it had been slain. And so previously, when Christ appears in the seals and in there in chapter 13, he's the lamb slain. You know, and that, that, you know, highlights that that was the path that he walked. You know, in, in the Gospels, Jesus says, you know, um, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You know, that idea, and, and we're very quick to apply that to dying to self. Um, but, you know, the the whole taking up his cross that's a that's a, a, a death sentence that's an execution that's being willing to give up your life to follow him you know and they are willing to to follow the lamb wherever he leads you know um and previously both times the lamb's been mentioned he's been slain and so they're, they're going through this time they're not loving their lives unto death you know they're willing wherever he leads, whether it be life or death, they're simply following him. It also refers to them as being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now, can someone read for me uh, back in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 2, Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 2 and 3. This is 2.22. Jeremiah chapter 2. Verse okay. two and three. Two and three, okay. Um, go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kingdom of thy, <coughs> thy youth, the love of thine expo espousals, when <coughs> thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that, that was not sown. Israel... Oh, I'm sorry. Somebody else have to take over. <coughs> Somebody read verse two, please. No problem. Okay, shall I start at verse three? Verse two. Okay, maybe I'll do two and three again. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend evil. Sorry, all that, all that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. So what is the event being spoken of here? Where he calls them his first fruits. <coughs> I 
uh, the wilderness, mm. 40, 40 years in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Yep, God's come. He's saved them out of Egypt. He's called them to be his people. He's led the, leading them through the wilderness. And he calls them uh, the, the first fruits. You know, th those were the first fruits that he saved out of Egypt. Um, and so you got the it's, it's similar idea there that there was this nation that was going to destroy them. God saved them as the first fruits through the Red Sea and fought against their enemies to deliver them. And so it speaks about, you know, God's God's great deliverance for his people there, rescuing his uh, the first fruits out of Egypt, which are the first fruits of the rest of God's people that would come afterwards. And so the 144,000 we have pictured as being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now, as we mentioned, after the 144,000 are pictured here, next we've got the three angels' message in Revelation. But then down in verse 14 of Revelation 14, we see this picture of a harvest. He says, and I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud, one sat like unto the son of man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And the cry goes out that the harvest of the earth is ripe. And so we have the first fruits here of God's people that, that are faithful. That, that, that are ready and then afterwards the full harvest comes and we have this the, the resurrection um can someone read for me revelation 22 um this is speaking about the new heaven and new earth and read verse three and four and there's something I find interesting there. We, we see the 144,000 having the seal of the living God in their foreheads um, as a sign of that, you know, they have been sealed, settled to the truth where they cannot be moved, that, that perfection of character. But how are all of God's people described here in Revelation 22, verse 3 and 4? And there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Is there any more? No, that's, thank you. Okay. So while we've got the 144,000, are the only ones before the second coming that have the seal of God on their foreheads, that have the name of God sealed in their foreheads. After the resurrection, the new heaven and new earth, all of God's people do that. As all his servants that serve him will have his name in their forehead. You know, we will all have perfection of character there. We will all have that, that complete victory, but the 144,000, are those that have perfected that, this side of the second coming. That's the experience that they have had of being sinless in a sinful world with, with the entire world against them. They have been faithful to Christ in that. They have that experience, this side of the second coming. That's why no one else can sing that song. Now, the, the final thing we read there in verse five. Uh, oh, go, Petra. I think that's also where it fits the counted all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, because the bigger the bigger the temptations, the more you're going to see the power of God when you walk with them. Mm -hmm. And and quite like that. So if you focus on the temptation that's what's going to be the biggest thing. But if you focus on the power of God in an impossible situation, then you get to see and taste and walk and experience something awesome. Mm -hmm. 
the final thing we read about them in verse 5 of chapter 14, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now that saying that they are without fault, I looked up a few different verses in the New Testament where it used that. It's actually from the, the a single um, Greek word, without fault. Um, and it's translated differently in different places. Um, but it, it all means that same thing. Um, can somebody read for me? First Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Actually, read verse 18 and 19. First Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Sorry, what book is it? First Peter. First Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. I'll read it. Um, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Hmm. So when it speaks about him as being uh, without blemish, that's that same phrase of without fault that is used at the 144,000. It's also the same in, um, used in Hebrews 9.14, when it speaks about, you know, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The idea of Christ being the sacrifice without spot, you know, without blemish. That's that same word used there, that they were without fault before the throne of God. It's used of, of Christ as being that, that perfect lamb, that perfect sacrifice. And the word is also used in Ephesians 5. Can someone read Ephesians 5, verse 25 to 27? Was that, sorry, Ephesians 5, 25 to 27? Yes. <clears throat> Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. <coughs> Sorry, without blemish. Mm. And that without blemish, is that same thing that Christ is referred to as being this lamb without blemish, that the 144,000 are without blemish before the throne of God. And I find this, you know, that, that final thing of how it sums up their characters being without blemish, that is the same way that Christ was described that they are faultless, without blemish, without any stain of sin upon them. But it's not by their own works. It's not by their own efforts. Here in Ephesians, it describes how did they get there? How did God's people get to be without blemish, without fault before the throne of God?
And so we see here, just like when it's spoken about them as being virgins, Christ, uh, sorry, Paul in there in Corinthians speaks about the church being presented as a chaste virgin, because that is the extent to which the gospel is able to make us new. You know, behold, all things are new. We, we are in Christ. We are a new creation. And here, the church, by Christ's own sanctifying power, is presented as being without fault. And again, this is the experience of the 144,000. They are those that were redeemed from among men, those that are without fault, that have washed their you know, robes in the blood of the Lamb and made them white. That is the experience God's people have that will live through this final time, that will give this final message. This complete sanctification, this complete abiding in Christ, that his work is fulfilled. 